sit-down strikers of the 1930s. And I would say that they understood that as well. They understood that the way to force a corporation to do something it doesn't want to do is to sit down at the center of its power and refuse to leave until it at least listens to you. And in that listening, if it does not change, uh, then you change it. I would like to like get some historical perspective. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us historically at US history, this moment in history of United States politics, where are we standing? Mm -hmm. It's a very common moment, actually. We've had moments like this a lot uh, throughout our history. And it's important to understand that the United States was not founded uh, as some sort of philosophical experiment. It was founded in revolt against an economic oppression that uh, a great many people felt was uh, weighing down on them in ways that would make it impossible to, for them to form a decent life. Uh, the Boston Tea Party was a rejection of a corrupt uh, alliance between the British monarchy and the British East India Tea Company, which was charging American colonials uh, more money for their tea. So the bottom line is that our history has often seen uh, moments where we the people have risen up and said, look, we just do not accept uh, the calculus that we're being fed. Uh, historically, we often look at the Great Depression as a moment uh, like that. But in reality, we've had such moments again and again throughout history. And so I don't see this as a, as a particularly distinct moment. Uh, it is an essential one, however, because the great progressive uh, activist, Robert M. LaFollette, used to always say that there was not any new fight in America. It was always the old fight. And that is that when the people achieve some basic liberties, uh, and those liberties were related to their economic life, not merely their political life, uh, the corrupt and corrupting uh, wealthy powers of the country, of the state, would seek to diminish those rights, would seek to find new ways to take them away. And we've seen that again and again in American history. Now we're seeing it in some very, very dark ways. In fact, uh, this can be distinguished from the past in one sense, and that is that our corporations are bigger, they're more powerful, and they have more leeway to operate in our political life than any time since the late 19th century. So it's harder to fight back now, but uh, people are fighting back with a greater energy. And that's what's exciting about what's going on right now. We have, uh, across this country, in Wisconsin, in Ohio, in Michigan, in Arizona, in Florida, state-based struggles against an austerity agenda that would say that we have to balance our budgets by taking food stamps away from our poorest people, by taking lunch money away from our poorest children so that billionaires can get tax cuts. The madness of that calculus has caused millions of Americans to rise up uh, at the state level and then more recently at the national level through the Occupy Wall Street movement. Big things are happening in America right now. These things have roots in American history, roots in American tradition, but they are of this moment and they will succeed as past revolts against concentration of wealth and power have. The reason they will succeed is because just as wealth, just as power has become more sophisticated, uh, more powerful, so too have people evolved. And the way we've evolved is by developing new means of communication. We're no longer locked into an old media uh, structure, an old media mindset. And in the one thing that draws all of the struggles of this moment together in Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan, Arizona, as well as at the national level as we look at Occupy, is a brilliant use of social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, as well as an alliance with the new media outlets, Pacifica, Amy Goodman's Democracy Now!, community stations across this country that are breaking through the wall that separates uh, the people from the information they need. So we're getting the information, we're rising up, it's an exciting moment. It has a 1776 character to it. It has an 1861 character to it. It has a 1935 Depression Era character to it. It has a 1965 Civil Rights Anti-War character to it. But it is its own moment, and it is going to be the transformational moment, because now we have to go to the belly of the beast. We have to address the critical crisis in this country, and that is the obscene concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a tiny less than 1% of Americans.
You mentioned two groups, yeah. the ruling class and the Occupy movement. Yeah. So very contrast. Yeah. Very, very, they're going like locking, locking horns are going at all. Can you elaborate on that, uh, especially with the Occupy movement, especially about the economic base? Well, I think the Occupy movement uh, needs to be understood as something different than how it's usually talked about. Generally, we talk about Occupy, and we have an image of the folks in Zuccotti Park, of uh, you know, it, kind of more traditional protest, uh, a sit-in, a, a march. But in reality, Occupy is a national movement that has manifestations in every state of the country and in every community. And it ranges from uh, folks showing anti-corporate movies in small towns to uh, folks starting to run for public office to take over their local governments to folks uh, organizing unions. But the thing that the unifying factor is a sense on the part of tens of millions of Americans uh, who have come to use the term Occupy uh, as a reference point, not really as a frame, but as a reference point. And what they're saying is very simply, this, this economic order that we have developed in this country is antithetical to democracy. You cannot have a democracy in America if a handful of people have so much wealth concentrated in their hands that they can not only run our economic life but run our political life. And so the genius of Occupy is that it says we don't have to accept this, we can revolt against it, and we don't have to wait till the next election to do so. We can push back in the streets on the courthouse steps uh, in a thousand different ways. And that's what's exciting about this moment. We're actually expanding the definition of democracy. The rulers of any country want less democracy. They are never friends of democracy because democracy is what threatens them. The people want more democracy. Uh, but unfortunately in America, we've had such a stilted conversation for so long that there's been a sense that democracy revolves around elections. It doesn't. Democracy is a 24-7, round-the-clock activity. Robert M. La Follette, the great progressive, used to say that democracy is a life, that we have to recognize that elections can produce good rulers or bad rulers. They can produce good results or bad results. But if the people view democracy as something they have to constantly be engaged in, not merely to vote, but to hold those who have been elected to account on a daily basis, when that happens, and that's really an underpinning of the Occupy movement, when that happens, then democracy becomes real. And then those who have power and those who have tended to expand their power when most of us aren't looking between elections are suddenly being held to account. That accountability moment is really going to be the transformational moment in America. And I think it has the potential, the potential to make this a very, very different and dramatically better country. Is that why Citizen United is very anti-democratic? Sure. So, I mean, look, anything that allows rich people to buy elections is a bad thing. And let's just say, and I mean, and I'm talking about, this includes wealthy individuals. I want to emphasize this, that, that you know, the, the unfair use of wealth uh, to define our elections is a bad thing. Now, the weird thing is that sometimes we on the left feel okay about it. We say, well, you know, there's this rich candidate who's pretty progressive, and so we like that. But we shouldn't. We should not like the notion that a wealthy person or a corporation can buy an election result. It just doesn't function. Uh, back to Occupy movement. Do you think Occupy movement and Black Panther Party have a lot of things in common? Because that's what Black, Black Panther Party was after education, mm. health, and feeding people. Look, I, I think you can find hundreds of movements in American history that uh, might give an idea, uh, some values, some frames, some approaches uh, to Occupy. But I think it's important to understand Occupy as a distinct, fun a distinct phenomenon. Uh, Occupy is different. And it is different because it has understood some things that many movements in the past have not. Uh, I happen to think Black Panthers have contributed tremendously to uh, the discourse and to a lot of ideas about organizing. But there's a, something very interesting about Occupy, and that is its emphasis on the physical, on the notion that you would go to a, a place of power, you would go to uh, a capital or to a courthouse or to the center of our economic power on Wall Street, and you would physically place yourself there and refuse to leave until something changes. This goes back, I think, you, know, you can find certainly Black Panther reference points, civil rights movement reference points, but I would go to another one, and that is the sit-down strikers of the 1930s. And I would say that they understood that as well. They understood that the way to force a corporation 
to do something it doesn't want to do is to sit down at the center of its power and refuse to leave until it at least listens to you. And in that listening, if it does not change, uh, then you change it. You alluded to it already. Uh, Wisconsin produced Bob LaFalle and also produced Joe McCarthy. Sure. You want to expand on that? Well, look, populism takes many forms. And uh, just as democracy can produce good results and bad results, uh, there can be a good populism and there can be a bad populism. The one thing that's striking to me is that everybody agrees now, the right and the left, that uh, Washington isn't working and we need a populist response to it. The Koch brothers tried to manipulate one with the Tea Party movement. And I think that you see many references in the Tea Party movement uh, that relate to Joe McCarthy. And Joe McCarthy was a populist. I mean, and what is the Tea Party movement obsessed with? You know, somebody's a socialist or somebody's a foreigner or somebody's different. Well, you know, I've studied Joe McCarthy. That's, that he worked that turf uh, as well. And obviously the Koch brothers themselves, uh, big funders of the Tea Party movement, their father was a founder of the John Birch Society, which was in many ways an extension of the McCarthy era uh, into the political life of the Republican Party. So you can see these connections. I, I, I don't get worried um, when right-wingers try to speak uh, a populist language. Uh, that's, that is their right. We are a free society. They can say what they want. What worries me is when the left doesn't speak a populist language, when the left is so mild, so cautious, that it doesn't go out and stir things up. I'm, I've been speaking a lot about the recent French elections. And the striking thing about France until very recently was that the theory was that the working class and that uh, a great portion of the French society was going uh, far to the right, that it was embracing you know, something akin to uh, uh, neo-fascism, anti-immigrant, uh, corporatist kind of views uh, associated with Le Pen and his, his movement. But what happened in this year's French elections is something altogether different. Uh, a populist of the left, Mélenchon, stu stood up and said, no, we can tax the rich. We, can, we don't have to blame immigrants. We can look at the people who've really taken our money and we could take a lot of it back. We could tax them to such an extent that if, uh, if they don't willingly help us to shape a society, that we will shape it without them. They can leave the country as tax exiles. I mean, he was very dismissive of the elites. And the fascinating thing was, that in some ways, that was very parallel to how Le Pen and those associated, those often accused of being neo-fascists, talked about immigrants. But the fascinating thing is that here, somebody on the left is, instead of saying, let's make the immigrants leave, this guy's saying, well, let's make the billionaires leave. You know, let's, let's tax them, and if they want to go someplace else, that's fine, because we believe that the wealth of this country belongs to the people and that it's produced by the people. Um, and it's worked. Uh, Le Pen, uh, the Le Pen party uh, lost a lot of support. It actually weakened tremendously, and suddenly the whole world is talking about the rise of a new left in France. What, what happened there? The only thing that happened was that the left started to speak up in volatile, intense, and passionate, but also very meaningful and sound language about economics. I think that's the, that's the reality of it. I don't ever get all that upset about right-wing populism. I get a, upset about the, the lack of left-wing populism. So you have a prediction about the uh, election in Wisconsin? Yes, I, I think that, that Wisconsin is really the first great challenge to uh, the global austerity agenda in the United States. It's the first place where you've really put that agenda on the ballot. Uh, you have a governor who sought to attack labor rights, who sought to attack uh, local democracy, voting rights, and really to do so in the interest of increasing the power and the wealth of, of multinational corporations. His first act was to lower taxes for corporations. His second act was, to act was to try and take away labor rights. So it's such a clear contrast. And now it's on the ballot. The governor himself is being recalled. It's my sense that he will be defeated. Um, he will be defeated because politicians like this, um, when they overreach, uh, offend the basic sensibilities of citizens. And when it becomes clear what the battle is about, when it is a battle about whether working people will have basic rights to speak up in their workplace and in the politics of the country, uh, citizens vote for that. In Ohio, when they put their anti-labor law on the ballot, uh, first time in American history where a state voted on whether to extend collective bargaining rights to public employees, Ohioans voted 61 percent to 39 percent. Eighty-two of 88 Ohio counties voted in favor of labor rights. No one would have predicted that, but there's this fundamental reality. When you actually give the people a choice about whether they're going to have the right to speak up in their workplace and in their political life, they embrace it. Two, th two questions. And one, the, uh, the question is, 
uh, you talk about vernaculars and language that yeah. the left needs to use. Would you step forward and say, here's the language that needs to be uh, applied? Or, uh, I think that we've already seen the language uh, put forward by Occupy. I'm always fascinated by people who say that Occupy doesn't, you know, they don't know what Occupy stands for. The fact of the matter is that our, the argument of the left should be a very simple one. And that is that you cannot have a democracy when, when wealth and political power is concentrated in the hands of the few. It must be available to all. That doesn't mean that, that you're going to have pure equality. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to have the same amount of money or everybody's even going to have the same amount of political speech. Some people won't choose to engage in politics. Some people don't choose to make a lot of money. But the bottom line is that you have to have some sort of equivalence so that uh, a working mom can have at least as much voice in our politics as she would seek to have, and that that voice would be you know, heard, that it can't be denied and dismissed, and most importantly, that it can't be shouted down by a billionaire who happens to be able to buy a lot more ads. The way you do that, the way you do that is to ban all money from politics and to fund your campaigns with public, public expenditures. It is the only way to do it. Anybody who wants to come up with some other calculus is lying to themselves and also lying about democracy because a democracy that is unequal in speech, that has unequal speech, is not a democracy. It is a, it is a monopoly. And some people have a monopoly on power and other people are rendered spectators. I don't think that's appropriate for America. And I think that progressives, I think the left in America, should get better at talking about the fact that we need a real democracy in this country and a democracy that will be fair to all. Wealthy people will be treated fairly. Poor people will be treated fairly. But there will not be such a disconnect in our politics that we presume that the wealthy will always have the dominant hand. That's not, that's not a democracy. That's not a functional politics. Thank you very much. Anything you would like to add? Anything you would like to encourage people to I would simply, for the tweet? I'll simply say that, that independent media, uh, as it exists in communities across this country and as it exists increasingly as a national model, is the essential backbone of our communications because our corporate media does not do a good job of communicating about fundamental issues of democracy. So it's independent community, not-for-profit media. There's some people in major media who do a great job, and I work with many of them and respect them greatly. But we really need a network of community and not-for-profit broadcasting across this country. And so I celebrate this, this as an essential underpinning, not just of our communications, but of democracy itself. Thank you very much. No problem, brother. Uh